Okay, so um, I think we are pretty much on time to get started. Um, I'm sure that people will join in as we go. So um, firstly, to, to all of the, the particip participants, thank you very much for attending our, our MarTech uh, Smart Asset Preventing Switchgear Failure Through Online Condition Monitoring webinar. Um, my name is James Cowling. I'm the sales executive for MarTech, responsible for the technology and the solutions that we offer. Um, I'll be managing the some of the, the, the second world, the, the second part of the presentation. Um, Johannes Kutsia, uh, Martex Managing Director, will give you a, a brief introductory um, or introduction with regards to Martech. And then Noldo uh, Besta will be doing the back end, looking at our in time monitoring um, solutions and what we're currently doing in, in the South African market uh, related to uh, in time monitoring on Switchgear. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Johannes for the initial few slides, and then I'll take over, and then I'll, I'll manage the back end. Thanks, James. And uh, yeah, most definitely, we don't want to make this at all look uh, like or feel like marketing. The whole idea of the session is to share some knowledge and uh, to bring people into uh, under better understanding of some of the technology that's out there and the, the methodologies out there. Um, so we'll go through effectively the assessment methods as the agenda, and James, I think maybe... Uh, uh, we don't have to go into too much detail at this point in time into what we want to discuss at each of these points. Uh, common failures, we'll have a look at switchgear temperature monitoring, case study, definitely important to look at how, this, actually, how do we use this in, in practice. It's all good and fine to, to have theories and, and draw lines and, on a piece of paper, but can you do it in practice and what does it look like in practice? So we'll go through that. Uh, how to use PD surveys, uh, cable PD case study, uh, IoT switchgear monitoring systems, and the switchgear PD case study, and PD monitoring case studies. You'll see that we really made sure that there's quite a lot of case studies in here to show the practicality of, of all of this. I, th I just want to reiterate again, especially for the people that just joined, um, there is a QA and a button that, uh, that you'll see on the bottom of your screen. Please post your questions there. Uh, we will read those questions during the, the session in a way we feel they are applicable to be answered. And if we don't get to your question during the session, uh, we'll circle back to that uh, at the end of the session and make sure that we go through those individual questions. And once again, for the, 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 the guys that just joined, and thank you very much for joining us to, today. James, I think let's get to the, to the next slide. Um, as I said, you know, the emphasis today is definitely not on, on telling you who Martek is, but... Uh, very quickly, just where does this fit in and why are we actually presenting this to, to you? Um, Martec effectively has five pillars that we, that we stand on in terms of our service and product offering. Uh, from a technology and systems, we supply hardware that we import from, uh, from all over the world. Um, we've got 21 suppliers, of, of principal suppliers in terms of OEMs that we uh, purchase hardware from and that we've got distributing um, agreements with that we bring into South Africa all around the condition monitoring theme. Then on the field service side, we actually go into the field and we do service at clients. We assist them with um, implementing hardware. We assist them with assessing the condition of their assets, uh, both on the electrical and the mechanical space. On the academy side, we do training in the condition monitoring field, assisting companies to develop skills in their, in their workforce. On the advisory side, we uh, assist companies with consulting in the field of condition monitoring, uh, plant readiness studies, uh, CMAPS, which is a condition improvement program uh, assessment, um, and any reliability type of questions that we assist clients with. And then the topic for the day uh, and where our topic fits in very nicely in these five pillars is the inter monitoring and diagnostics lead. Now there, we take the various other aspects we just discussed and we effectively combine them in a single offering uh, uh, combined with IoT technology to give the client the best possible uh, usage of the data that they gather in terms of condition monitoring. So you get uh, uh, very near real-time data or as real-time as you require it. In other words, we refer to it as in-time data and to use that in-time data to the best of your uh, plant's needs uh, in terms of ensuring that your reliability is really well looked after. So that's sort of just a, a very short nutshell of why we, we wanted to discuss this topic. And on the next slide, James, I think we'll, we'll address a little bit about where this is fitting to the bigger picture. Why specifically switch gear? Now, if we, and just maybe quickly the logic behind this, there's a lot of uh, items on this page. If you work from left 
of your screen to the right, effectively you're following the stream of electricity, if you like, or the flow of electricity, all the way from generation, uh, through transmission, distribution, then going into the various sectors. Uh, and then effectively you get to this point where you have to connect to that electricity, your specific plant or mine or um, government facility has to be connected to the distribution network. And that happens via transformers and switch gear. And from there, it goes into your respective plant. Whatever that could be in a mining environment or in a manufacturing environment, or as I said, in a, in a facilities environment, there would be a, a, a multitude of connected assets. But your switch gear and your transformer is, is, is typically one of the key areas where if there's a problem in, in your switch gear in particular, uh, you could have lengthy duration of downtime in your plant. And many companies overlook the sensitivity and the, the criticality of their switch gear. So if we assume for the moment, switch gear being an, a very key component in your overall plant reliability, what is it that we can do about switch gear? And how can we look at switch gear, making sure that we maximize the reliability of that uh, component of your risk, overall plant risk assessment? So that's sort of the logic behind today. Um, I think we'll get into the, the nuts and bolts of that now, James, on the next slide, you know, and we'll move a little bit further into the detail around switch gear, but just from a theoretical point of view, you know, there's a couple of things that you want to monitor on any asset. Um, and and uh, from on the left, the asset status, uh, you know, you could mo monitor condition monitoring on an offline asset or online. And important when we refer to online or offline here is not anything to do with the internet. This is whether the asset is energized or not. You know, so if an asset is energized, especially on the electrical side, there's certain things that you want to monitor. And if an asset is not energized, there's other things that you could also monitor. And those um, assessments are obviously different. Uh, that then in the middle block, if you get to the condition assessment in terms of uh, the top one, shot work, you know, understanding what you want to do during the upcoming shots, you know, uh, making sure that you understand the condition of that asset so that you've got a full scope of work that you can plan into your upcoming shots effectively. Also from a quality insurance point of view, typically under the commissioning phase, when you commission new assets, you know, are you happy that those assets, especially when you talk about MV and HV, that the quality assurance is done prior to the energization of those assets to prohibit any potential failures that could cause serious damage or potential in injury. And then obviously in line with that factory acceptance testing. Um, on the bottom there, uh, we have uh, condition monitoring trending. And uh, obviously this is when the plant is more an operational phase. You want to understand either from a periodic, periodic point of view or an in-time point of view, uh, you know, periodic being every three months or six months, or whatever the case might be on, on the specific needs of your asset, what is the uh, condition of that asset and in-time monitoring obviously much, much faster uh, in an in a almost real-time basis, you know, what is the condition? Depending on the failure mode and there's needs for both of those, depending on the cost uh, associated. I'm not gonna go through all of it right through the end, end but I think you, you get the, the drift. James, anything you want to add on this slide and maybe let's uh, let's get into the, the nuts and bolts of, of switch gear and, and get to the technical bits of, of today. Yeah, thanks for that, Johannes. Uh, thanks for the for the, 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 the basic background. Uh, so just to, to add to what Johannes said, um, from a, a, a condition assessment uh, force, and, and specifically today we're looking at switch gear, um, just to understand that typically, um, you know, switch gear is, is an asset that, you know, um, is in operation probably 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, you know, it can be in operation for, for months, even years without any outages. So from a, a MARTIC point of view, we've, we've, we've primarily focused on how can you monitor those assets while they're in operation without taking them out of service. Um, we'll show you some, some case studies and some information on, on how we do that from an online point of view. But then we'll also show you um, what we do from an offline point of view, um, specifically related to, you know, for example, in the, in the case study, we'll show you related to cables. Um, but that's really, you know, looking at it, but also just to mention, you know, already uh, the level of analytics. So going from basic alarm thresholds, where from a, a single assessment, we can identify and risk rank your, your assets. I'll show you some information on that all the way through to the technology that Nolda is going to be discussing, where we're looking at sophisticated analysis 
phase result data on partial discharge, um, looking at load, humidity, temperatures, um, and pulling all of that into the analytical side, um, which we'll discuss um, a little bit later on in the presentation. But to kick off with, um, to look at, you know, th these are some international statistics um, that we use from, our, uh, from a lot of our principals or suppliers. Um, and looking at, you know, understanding the failure modes in medium voltage, specifically air insulated switchgear. We're not looking at, at the, the, the more higher voltage SF6 type equipment. Um, and, you know, really looking at some of the assets and components. Um, I think just to, to make a comment from a local point of view or South African context, there could be a few slight variations. We, we have a lot of uh, instances of, you know, cable theft, um, you know, those sort of things, which will skew our figures slightly in comparison to some of the international statistics. Um, but if you have a look at the switchgear modes, and this is typically up to, you know, 22, 33 kV um, air insulated switchgear, um, metal clad switchgear typically. Um, if you have a look at the failure components, um, starting off on the mechanical side, um, I'll, you know, that's really where you've got issues related to, um, you know, mechanical looseness, poor connections, those sort of things, but also down to um, circuit breaker alignment, is the breaker, uh, you know, making contact. Um, and then we have what's known as discharge. Um, so we'll discuss what, what is known as PD. So it's one of the key indicators of assessing uh, the condition of your switchgear while it is in operation to determine if there's any issues. Um, so I'll show you a little bit of, or we'll play a video related to what is partial discharge and how it can affect or how it can be used as a, as a detection and an analytical tool to monitor the condition of your switchgear. We then have the VTs, the CTs, um, the cable box or the cable termination area. Um, in the South African market, um, in the areas where we as MarTech work, um, it's probably the statistics that we see there, you'll see that internationally the cable, you know, the cable box or cable terminations are, are relatively low, um, sitting at around about the uh, 6% area, whereas in, in the markets where, where we're doing um, service or we'll be doing monitoring, uh, in the South African context, the, the cable terminations and the joints um, actually is a larger problem um, from a, a quality assurance point of view and a workmanship point of view than the typically than that 6% that you see in the international statistics. But if you have a look at these overall, um, you know, apart from the maloperation and the protection side, which we're not discussing today, um, if you are able to use technology and monitor, um, you know, things like temperature and partial discharge, um, that should allow you to detect up to 70% of, of, of the defects listed above uh, from a statistical point of view. And up to 85% of your failures um, can be detected or attributed to picking a partial discharge early uh, in, in the process. And as that partial discharge gets worse, it'll, it'll, it'll create more of the issues related to tracking, um, arcing, um, and then eventual failure. James, as per any engineering uh, fraternity, we have our fair share of uh, acronyms. So maybe just uh, VTs and CTs for, for the crowd, assuming we'll get to parcel discharge, as you mentioned, and uh, yes. MV uh, medium voltage. Uh, but VTs and CTs maybe quickly? Uh, your, your voltage transformers and your current transformers, which are typically in, in, in the switchgear itself. So your, you know, your incomers, you'll have, a, you know, you'll have a VT and then you'll have CTs positioned within the switchgear. Um, I'll show you an example of... Uh, partial discharge on a, on, a, on a CT, for example, a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and then, of course, your vacuum is your vacuum breakers, um, you know, lightning, um, which be lightning strikes, and then, you know, water or moisture ingress, um, you know, would also be, be part of that. Um, but as we said, these are, you know, international statistics, and I think the South African market, there, there may be some ab uh, abnormalities or slightly different uh, perceptions related to the types of failures and the number or the percentages that are, but you know, for for today's presentation, it's it's, it's giving you a, a broad overview. And then, if we delve a little bit deeper into it, um, because one of the aspects that we see as as Martech, um, you have the switchgear itself, but if you look at the switchgear, it's part of a complete system, and and the cable um, system is connected to the switchgear. And from a, a Martech point of view, um, we have tens of thousands of uh, you know, tests that are performed online and with uh, permanent online monitoring related to the switchgear, but also to the, uh, to the connected equipment, which is either going to be a transformer or a motor or a generator or a cable. 
Um, and we do see that um, in our markets, um, cable failures, either related to the terminations or to the joints or to the cable insulation, um, are a, a quite a high percentage. Um, and there are differences between PILC or paper insulated lead cable and XLPE cables. Again, this is international statistics, um, but uh, we find that the trends are relatively similar in our markets. So if we look at um, the different types of cable insulation, um, we can see that on paper cables, uh, the terminations and the joints uh, form a, a, a reasonable sort of balanced percentage of the failure rates. And then of course, in paper insulated lead cables, moisture ingress, um, drainage of the compound in pull cable, specifically where the cable goes from a horizontal to a vertical position into the switch gear, um, that, that paper can start drying out over time. And that's where you can start having um, issues related to picking a partial discharge in the cables, which you can use as a diagnostic tool. And then in XLPE cables, by far the biggest issue that we see is on the terminations. Um, and that is related to um, the actual termination itself, how that termination is, is done uh, from a workmanship point of view during the initial installation. Um, also related to the type of termination, whether it's a cold or a, or, or a heat shrink type of joint and, and what's done on that. And then over time, we also see that um, not so much in the distribution type applications, but more in the manufacturing and mining applications where um, you've got uh, motors and pumps um, and people need to do a rotation change, for example, where they need to swap out a motor or a pump um, and they need to change direction. Um, we find that you know the terminations themselves may initially have been done well, but then during the, the, the rotation change, someone takes two phases and crosses them over above the stress control point on the termination, and that starts causing partial discharge. Um, and that can eventually lead to failures. We'll show some case studies. Uh, but as mentioned, um, you know, we do uh, as, as a business, um, you know, the joints and the well, terminations and the, the top right hand picture, you'll see. Um, some offline VLF testing, VLF tan delta and PD equipment that we use. So we also, um, you know, do offline testing as part of the quality assurance, which we mentioned. But also, if the online tests tell us that there is a problem, um, we, we will then have to do some offline testing to be able to pinpoint or locate where the defect is in the cable. Because to tell you that you've got a problem cable online is one thing, but you want to know where that problem is so you can fix it. I think, James, if I can just budge in there quickly. Yeah. Um, just on the cables itself, on the previous slide, uh, if you look at a, at a paper cable, it's also seen as a, as a, as a little bit towards uh, PDA, a bit more self-healing. It's got a bit of self-healing capabilities due to the type of insulation it's got. But when you look at XLPE, it's also a bit more forgiven um, for moving the termination around, bending the, that leads a bit more towards where you, when you bend the leads on a paper cable, you, you run the risk of tearing the paper insulation itself. So both, both types of cables have got its pros and cons, um, but also both types of cables being used in the industry uh, since uh, quite a long time ago. So um, just wanted to add that to the, to the two types of cables that was in this specific slide. Thanks. Thanks, Naldo. So, the primary causes of switchgear um, failures um, can really be broken. Up, well, if, if we exclude any of the protection um, systems, um, batteries, DC supplies, those sort of things where, where the protection hasn't operated or where there's been issues, um, there's, there's really two areas um, where you can identify or have defects that can cause a problem. So number one we see is what we classify as compromised connections. Those are going to typically be your bus bar, your breaker, and your cable terminations, um, where those are connected. Um, and if not done correctly, or if you've got a, a, a poor connection, which is going to cause um, poor contact, um, it's going to cause corrosion um, or wear um, from a vibration point of view, or it's just loose and that's then causing the, the hotspot that you would typically identify or an in industry where infrared technology is used to identify that, that, that loose or poor connection which is generating heat because of the current. 
Um, but then also uh, there can be some instances, you know, on the breakers where you've got misalignment while the breaker is being wrecked in. On the newest switchgear, um, it, it is not normally as much as an issue, but some of the older design switchgear, um, when the breaker wrecks in, um, it can wreck and skew, um, and that can cause, um, you know, compromised connection on the breaker, which can cause overheating on the breaker spouts. And then if you have a look at those defects, what is the result of those defects? It's typically um, elevated temperature. So those defects or those compromised connections are typically seen or identified or found due to a temperature increase, okay? And then the second part of your, your, your switchgear failures is really attributed to the insulation system. Um, and medium voltage switchgear is theoretically designed um, to be PD free. So if your switchgear is manufactured and maintained um, and serviced correctly, the theory is, is that if you have the, 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 the necessary clearances in place, if your maintenance is done, um, if there's no moisture ingress, um, you know, things can happen, you know, snakes, bats, spiders, rats, uh, those sort of things, um, or during maintenance operations, um, people will accidentally leave a spanner or a screwdriver or a, a bolt or something in the in, in the switchgear as part of the maintenance operations. Um, and those can then affect that insulation integrity, um, which then, then causes, you know, partial discharge. Um, but as I've mentioned before, uh, you know, workmanship on termination and joints is, is probably the biggest issue that we see in industry. Um, and then you've got age, contamination, uh, mechanical stress and damage, which is caused, you know, um, I think from a, from a, a municipality aspect, you know, people putting fiber in um, and they're working in the same servitudes or the same areas where you've got your cables installed, for example, and people are digging or, you know, installing fiber and they actually damage the, the medium voltage cable, for example. Um, you know, which is, you know, not really the cables issue. It's, you know, it's just because of, you know, people digging where they shouldn't be digging, or of course, in, in you know, where you have theft. Um, in certain areas, specifically in coastal areas, for example, not so much up on the reef in, 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 in Joburg um, and Pretoria, but, uh, you know, high humidity conditions, condensating moisture. Um, and, you know, I mentioned, uh, Johannes mentioned, you know, what is a CT? And this picture that you see over here, um, you can actually see the electrical treeing and the, and the discharge occurring on the CT stack. Uh, and this is down in, this is in a high humidity area at, at, at the coast. Um, this is in the Durban area. And that's just because of, of high humidity conditions that you actually start getting surface discharge occurring on the CTs themselves because of that, that high humidity and condensating moisture. But any of the, you know, any of the defects, whether it's temperature related due to poor, poor connections or whether you've got um, discharge related to cables or, or you know, the, the cables being too close together so you don't have the necessary clearances, um, or whether you've got issues related to insulation um, and you can see the electrical treeing and tracking on this on these insulator boards, or whether you've got cables too close together again, where you can actually see the hot spot on this specific cable here, where it's actually causing partial discharge because you're, you've got an issue above the stress control point. Um, okay, and these I'm, are, I'm yes. assuming that age is also a relative concept in, in terms of load shedding, you know, energizing and de-energizing switchgear uh, and obviously the temperature changes that, that coincide with that apart from the obvious operation, you know, uh, where you could have probably got um, many more years out of switchgear in the past, you know, how does it influence currently with, with load shedding? Well, I, I think, you know, there have been a, a lot of the, the, the larger metros and municipalities, I think City Power and Swanee and Cape Town Electricity have all done um, investigations into the fact that load shedding and having to switch um, and switch transformers and, and cables and, and operate them um, is having an impact on, on, on the design life and also the reliability of those assets. Um, you know, switchgear is, has a certain design functionality as far as the number of operations. Uh, transformers, ideally or realistically, if you look at distribution and transmission transformers and even the generation side, um, they don't like or they, they're not designed to be switched in and, or, and you know, switched on and off um, as much as, as what they, they could be, be occurring during load shedding. So those can definitely have some impacts on the reliability and the design life um, of the switchgear and of the cables and of the transformers. So it's, it's actually a network related issue as well. Um, so again, very valid 
comment about um, load shedding, and it does have an impact um, in the, the reliability of, of, of the, the switchgear um, and the, the connected components as well. Right, um, we've mentioned the misalignment aspects, and this slide really just you know, identifies some of the aspects within MarTech um, as part of what we do. Um, we, we do use infrared technology, but infrared technology is, oh, and we'll get into the, to the temperature monitoring side. Um, infrared, you know, it's a surface technology. So IR can't see into the switchgear unless you're using an infrared window, for example, on the cable termination, or you've, you've got an infrared window connected somewhere that you can actually visibly use an infrared camera and actually look into the switchgear. Um, but we, from a, a contact discharge or misalignment point of view, um, we actually pick it up with, we, we call it um, partial arcing, where because of the misalignment of the, of, of the breaker onto the, onto the bus bar or onto the contacts, we pick up partial arcing, um, and that is identified within the switchgear. So we can actually detect it using partial discharge. Uh, so it's a contact discharge. It, in, it, it creates intense heat, which if it's internal to the switchgear, you may not be able to see with infrared. It can cause temporary welding. It, 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 it overheats the, or the insulation systems around those points. And uh, as we all know that, uh, you know, a 10 degree increase in temperature halves the life of any insulation material. So if your insulation system is used to be running at, let's say, 50 degrees C and it now goes up to 60 degrees Celsius, um, you've effectively halved the life of that insulation system by, by the 10 degree C rule, which is effectively the Arrhenius plot, of, um, which is used to determine the, the thermal um, rating of any insulation system. And again, these slides just typically here, uh, you can see failure on the breaker here. You can see the damage and the overheating on the breaker sprouts. And this is actually looking up into the switchgear. And this is where, due to misalignment, you actually get the silicon shrouds actually retain inside the, the actual contact. And then when they take the breaker out, they just add another one. And it actually tilts the breaker. So when they switch it in, it actually gets even worse. So that, that's one aspect that we do see. Um, but getting on to temperature monitoring on switchgear. Um, historically, what has been done? Um, you know, if you have a look at it, switchgear, um, downtime for maintenance is rare. Um, you know, companies may only take their main incoming substation down for maintenance on an annual basis. Um, you know, maybe if they're lucky, they're doing it on a six monthly basis. Um, but we have other customers or other clients where their, their shutdown is really about a, a four-year period. They want to be running every four years before they actually have a, a full outage to do maintenance on, on, the, on the switchgear itself. Um, I'm not talking about the protection and the relay testing side. Um, you know, I'm talking about the actual you know, opening up, looking at bus bar, looking at breakers, looking at cable terminations. Um, so it's, it is difficult to, to have these scheduled downtimes for maintenance. Um, and also, of course, if you look at the, the, the fundamental design of switchgear, and especially now on the newer types of switchgear, um, when you're looking at the, the arc flash um, specifications and the arc flash ratings, the switchgear is really starting to get really um, compact, but also the enclosures um, are very, very tight. So um, purely just to, to make sure that there's no, any, no arc flash incidents, um, you know, the, the, the newer design switchgear is really tightly sealed. So, you know, to be able to look at getting decent temperature measurements, um, you know, what are the options? And historically, um, people have used um, infrared temperature uh, or IR cameras um, and looking to see if they can detect anomalies from a, from a surface point of view because you couldn't, you're not seeing inside. Um, and then with the, with the, with the advances in, in infrared windows, um, and there's even combinations now of infrared and ultrasound windows where you can use an infrared, a window is designed to have infrared so that you can actually see into the cable termination, but it also has a ultrasound um, window designed in that you can actually use ultrasound technology to listen for partial discharge, arcing, tracking, and corona. Um, why hasn't, um, you know, why haven't infrared windows been installed in all switchgear? Well, infrared windows are expensive to buy. Um, and the fact is, is that they are more expensive to retrofit. If you don't have infrared windows in your existing switchgear, for you to retrofit, um, you know, is, you know, it, it, is, it can be expensive. And then there's also the question that always comes up is, have you now compromised your arc flash certification or your arc flash rating 
um, on your switch gear because you've now installed an infrared window. Um, in our markets, the majority of the windows are typically only installed in the cable box, so the cable termination box, because the majority of issues that have been identified are really related to the cable terminations and poor connections on the cables themselves. Um, and what else can be done? Um, you know, periodic monitoring by technicians going to a substation on a, on a periodic basis every three months or every six months, uh, taking an infrared gun or an infrared camera and going and scanning the substations. Um, in some instances, it can find defects, um, but it can also miss defects. You know, things can go wrong with it. You know, if someone does maintenance um, on a cable termination, for example, and they've actually re-terminated or they've, they've disconnected for a reason um, and they've done something wrong and no one's done that scanning, um, it can be missed. And, you know, operational factors um, such as load also play a very important aspect. Uh, you need to know that you're loading if you're doing infrared and you're seeing temperature variations uh, periodically between uh, on surface between incomers, for example. You do need to know that you're loading uh, what it's been like or what it was um, and what it is at now, because that, of course, can have an, an, an impact on what the temperature is that you're seeing. So what have people done in the past? Uh, people have looked at um, installing sensors, temperature sensors, RTDs, PT100s, thermocouples um, into switchgear to try and monitor temperature. Um, but of course, the problem that you have from an, in an inherent clearance point of view, um, copper or any other metal wires are an obvious no-no due to grounding because people, you know, if you run wires or cables in the switchgear itself, you compromise your clearances. Um, and, you know, if not done correctly or maintained correctly, if those fall or hit a bus bar or something, you, you're effectively causing more problems than what you would have had without having those systems in. Um, and even fiber optics um, can cause uh, some issues with dust and humidity uh, combined on them. And people have looked at or companies have introduced what are known as wireless sensors. Um, but the initial wireless sensors that were installed in switchgear um, were typically battery operated um, sensors. So the batteries themselves would run out over time. So you, you would then have to switch off to replace a battery, which is not always the best from a, a maintenance and from a reliability and also from a timing point of view. And batteries are subject to heat, which may have, you know, shortened lives in the field versus the ratings. Um, the batteries could only be changed, as I've said, during, you know, predictive maintenance downtimes. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, if one, if one battery fails, if one sensor fails, then typically people would be replacing them. And using lithium ion batteries, they themselves, um, you know, can, can explode. So we've started to see a, a technology which is known as surface acoustic wave or SOAR, which is effectively a totally passive sensor. It's based on frequency. So um, surface acoustic wave, effectively what happens is, is, is sensors are installed in the switchgear. They can be installed in the, in the main bus section. They can be installed in the, on the cable um, and they can be installed in the breaker, on the breaker. I'll show you some examples of those. So we've started to see customers installing um, smart temperature sensing um, systems for their, for their medium voltage switchgear. Um, the control systems are typically installed in the low voltage control cubicles and um, antennas, if you want to call them that, send signals to the temperature sensors themselves. Um, the temperature sensors use the frequency to wake up to, to effectively power themselves uh, to calculate a temperature and send that back to the antenna um, and then actually look at the temperatures. Um, so this is an example of a, you can see it here. So this is a, an IS485 sensor, um, which is effectively you bolt this onto, in this case, this is bolted onto the bus bar section over here. Um, and they, as we've mentioned, they're totally passive. Um, there's nothing connected to them at all apart from just being bolted onto the bus bar or onto a breaker or onto a cable termination point. And in this case, the antenna, um, and this is an old picture, the antenna is actually now even flat. They, they don't even protrude this far out. So effectively what happens is the antenna sends a signal, a frequency to the sensor. The sensor powers itself up, uh, uses that frequency and actually sends the temperature back. So you can actually monitor the temperature on the contacts themselves or on the bus bar. Um, so we are starting to see that um, as a technology um, being used more and more in switchgear. Uh, some applications that we have in the South African market. Um, you can see the sensors here uh, actually connected onto the breaker. Uh, this customer, this is a, a breaker on a 17 megawatt 11 kV air compressor. 
Um, and the switchgear itself is, is getting to the end of life um, as far as design, but also from a, a time point of view, it's been in, in operation for nearly close on 25 years. Um, and the customers got concerns about the contact temperature on the actual contacts themselves, uh, where the contacts are coming in, in, in contact with the bus bar. Um, so they actually limit or, or manage the load on the compressor by monitoring the temperature on the breaker contact spouts. Again, here's just a typical example of a medium voltage application where you can see the temperature sensors themselves installed on the main bus bar section. Um, and in the third picture, um, this is a low voltage, well, low voltage application, 525 volt. Uh, this is a boiler, um, a boiler feed board, uh, 525 volt, and you can see all of the sensors installed on the bus bar. Um, because it's a uh, low voltage but high current application, um, the customers are, are, are making sure that they can actually make sure what the, the bus bar temperatures are. Um, you, the sensors are installed um, at the OEMs. Uh, so this is a local OEM um, and we actually commission and test. Uh, this is part of the, the FAT testing before the switchgear leaves the factory. And then we also recommission um, once the switchgear gets to site and is installed. Uh, case study, uh, just as far as temperature monitoring is concerned, using uh, wireless sensors. Um, this is a 525 volt board. Um, you've got the fuses installed over here. You can see the temperature sensors sitting over there. Um, the, the customer decided that they wanted this information to sit on their SCADA system. So the monitoring um, devices connected into, into the panel actually communicate this um, straight to SCADA. And you can actually see uh, the difference, uh, you know, over time. Uh, so here you've got temperature on the one fuse, which is running at about the 50 degree mark. And you can see the other fuse now starts going up from 60. And then you can see due to poor contact, this spike going up to about 80 degrees Celsius on, on one of the fuse links. Um, and effectively just reseating that fuse addressed the hotspot. So if you have a look at the trend, bra the trend data on the right, um, you can actually see from a maintenance aspect or from when the, 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 the customer did the intervention, we can see that it was running at around about 80 degrees C. Um, they did the intervention. And after that, you can see that both the other phases are running at, at similar temperatures. So that's just a, a typical example of what can be done with temperature monitoring. James, just on the temperature monitor, yes. monitoring, uh, we've got a question that I think is quite relevant that we can okay. have a quick chat about. Um, Robert asked, where does the sensor send the reading to? And does it need to be manually downloaded? No. So from a design point of view, the sensor sit in this inside the switch gear. Your, this is known as an, this is, this is the actual monitoring device here that sits in the low voltage control cubicle of your switch gear. So whether it's medium voltage or, or, or low voltage, this information resides on this device that's, that, that's over here. And you can connect this device up to your SCADA or to a monitor in the substation um, and you can effectively record that information um, using these controllers over here. And then there was another question on, on this as well uh, from Mitchell. Uh, would st stating, would the temperature sensors be primarily for detecting loose connections and this type of scenario? So, so typically from a temperature point of view, the, the biggest issue that we see is loose connections. But um, I mean, as an example, we do have customers who are using it for load control. Um, so they actually, they, they're managing the, the, the load by looking at the temperature on the breaker. And then we also have some customers who have uh, current imbalance. Um, so may primarily maybe due in some furnace applications or where you've got an imbalanced load, um, they can actually see that there's an imbalance um, on one of the phases versus the other phases, um, you know, due to, you know, maybe some, some, some network issues or connection issues where they're pulling higher currents on a, on a specific phase versus the other two phases. But, but primarily the biggest issue is, is, is connection issues. Right, I'm just, con I'm just conscious of time, sorry, I'll keep quiet. Introduction. Partial discharge, PD for short. You will find PD activity in all types of high voltage power assets, from switch gear, to transformers, and overhead lines, to underground cables, causing degradation and failures. Because experience shows that PD activity 
is a contributory factor in more than 8 out of 10 disruptive failures in substations. And it is the most reliable indicator of the true condition of insulation in live assets. So, what exactly is partial discharge activity? How do we go about locating and measuring it? And how can we use that information to make assets more efficient and reliable at lower cost? Okay, so for, for people who weren't or, or wasn't sure what PD means, it's effectively partial discharge. And that video just really explains the basics. Um, today is not really to look into PD um, in a lot of technical detail. Um, we can, we, you know, that is something that we do um, as part of the other course. But from a MarTech point of view, PD is one of the primary detection or one of the primary drivers or one of the primary effects that we actually monitor to determine and monitor the health of switchgear. So, you know, what does partial discharge do? Uh, these are just some typical examples of PD. So you can see PD in, you know, insulation systems on connections, on, you know, VTs, on, you know, different aspects, and then also, um, you know, cable terminations. Um, and the, the effect is, is that over time, um, you know, PD doesn't go away. It's a voltage-related phenomenon. Um, so it's, it's based on clearances. So, you know, if you, if you do see this white powder in your switchgear, you know, wiping it away um, and saying, well, we've cleaned it off. That doesn't solve the, that doesn't solve the issue. It is going to come back. And also the fact is, is that there is actually some damage done um, underneath, for example, in this case, on a cable termination, underneath the heat shrink, there's already damage done, which is also going to cause problems. Why do we use PD? Well, we use it for a couple of, of, of for a couple of reasons. Um, we have service staff going into substations on a daily basis. So for, for us, um, one of the primary drivers we use it for is safety. So any staff going into the substation will use what are known as PD detectors, just to make sure that as they go into the substation, number one, it's safe. Number two, if they are working on panels or they are doing online PD assessments in the substation, that there isn't a defect already in the substation. Um, so they use it from a safety point of view to make sure that it's safe in the substation. Uh, and I'll, I'll play you a sound file. Um, this slide here, you, if you have a look here, you'll see that there's a, this is effectively external. We don't open up any panels. We don't open anything up. We effectively use an ultrasound sensor, which picks up the partial discharge, the arcing, the tracking of the corona uh, via air gaps. Um, so you can see this. And, and I mean, this substation here, the primary issue that they had was due to workmanship during the install. Um, you can actually see where this is the cable termination areas and actually you can see where the cable terminations are blown. Um, and this sound file, just uh, I'll play it, but you actually just hear, so the sensor is, is external to the switch gear and you can hear the partial discharge. You wouldn't, in, if you were in the substation um, and you didn't have the ultrasound or the PD detection technology, you wouldn't hear this. Sorry, and, and the beauty behind that is, is, is that from a maintenance point of view, you know, 90% of the time, if you go into a substation, you shouldn't hear anything. It's when you hear something, that means that you now need to plan your maintenance. And the fact that you are hearing that PD tells you that, you know, it's not going, typically it's not going to fail on you in hours or days. It's typically something that you can detect. And, you know, as long as you're, you, you plan your maintenance and fix it, um, you know, it gives you the ability to, to plan uh, those maintenance outages um, in advance and actually do the fixes themselves. What is it that we find with partial discharge? We find internal PD, which is within the insulation materials, which is a, a FOST uh, degradation. Um, and it's harmful from the point of view that the, typically the failures themselves can, can go from, you know, the, the PD values themselves grow very quickly. Um, and then you have failure. Surface discharge, cable terminations, tracking, um, you know, typically slightly less harmful as far as, um, you know, the type of defect. And then, of course, most people have heard not of, not of the coronavirus, but of, of electrical corona, um, which is really an air. Um, so it's a discharge to air. Um, it creates ozone, which attacks polymer insulation. But we don't see that as damaging as, as what we do in the internal discharge or surface discharge. Um, and just to be clear, ultrasound yes. is for your, your more advanced partial discharge already. 
the graphs that you just showed the earlier wasn't used uh, ultrasound wasn't used to generate those just maybe a, a quick statement. No, no, no so so ultrasound there's different types of pd technology so ultrasound is normally used for surface type discharge it's not you're not going to identify internal discharge with ultrasound uh, that's where we use different types of sensors so we typically use ultrasound um technology for surface discharge and for corona. So we use it for the bottom two. Uh, if it's internal, because it's internal to insulation system, you typically don't have an air path for the ultrasound to pick up the discharge. Uh, so we use different sensors, which, which I'll explain in a, in a minute or two. Um, from a risk reduction point of view, um, what is it that, that you can do on your switch gear? You can effectively rank your electrical assets, your network. Uh, basically from a level one to a level five. Level one being um, your network is good, there's no discharge, there's no partial discharge activity, um, all the way through to a level five where you've got a major PD um, and the components have reached the end of life and they need to be repaired or replaced. So from a, a, a system design, but you know, basically looking at mitigating any of your risk, if you look at a typical example of an electrical network, you can do this online, um, without taking your, net, your, your, your switch gear or your assets out of service, and you can effectively rank them. And in this case, this shows you that you've got some level threes where you don't need to be overly concerned. You know, those you typically look to reassess every six months to a year, but your level fours and level fives, you want to be assessing these sort of six monthly for level fours and, you know, level fives, you need to start actually looking at fixing them um, and, and monitoring and trending a lot closer, you know, either monthly or, or, or three monthly until you can get a shuttle, until you can get a spare and you can actually then do the maintenance activity and replace this. So, that, so what the beauty behind online technologies is it allows you to rank your electrical network and know from a maintenance point of view what you need to schedule. Um, talking about the different types of technologies for, for identifying PD, there's quite a few, you know, there's, there's radio. So we use radio frequency current transformers. We've mentioned ultrasound and, you know, if you uh, have had the unfortunate position to walk into a substation where there is partial discharge occurring, it creates ozone. Um, and you can actually, you know, when you walk into those substations, uh, you actually pick up that ozone um, smell and you actually know that you've got a problem. Um, so there's different technologies that we use. Um, I've mentioned that we use detectors for safety. So we use radio frequency devices, handheld devices, we use ultrasound devices, we use transient earth voltage sensors, and then from a temperature point of view, of course, infrared sensors. These devices, you know, they typically tell you that there's a problem. They can't tell you, you know, is it phase to phase? Is it phase to ground? Is it internal discharge? Um, or is it external or surface discharge? They're really detection devices, which are used from a safety point of view and from a basic condition monitoring point of view for you to identify where you've got problems in your substations. We then get on to the advanced diagnostics where we use um, some high-end PD um, test equipment, um, which allows us, for example, in this case, you can actually see that there's a sensor. Uh, let me just where my mouse is. We actually put the sensor around the cable external to the switch gear. And that allows us to identify, do we have internal discharge? Do we have tracking? Do we have partial arcing or do we have corona? We use some very expensive, very high-end PD analyzers to do this type of work. Um, but as I said, you know, we do this online um, without taking anything out of service. Um, just some typical examples of sensors, as I've mentioned, uh, the, the horseshoe type sensor, which goes around the cable. Uh, in this case, this is a mini sub where you actually put the sensor around here. And then I've mentioned the HFCT sensors where if we have access to the cable earth, we can put the sensor around the cable earth. We could put the sensor around the cable, uh, the, the conductor itself, or we could put it around the conductor and the cable earth uh, just to give us more sensitivity. So there's James, different just, types of, yes. Sorry, just, just on this slide, there was a, a question earlier by Robert as well, but I think uh, we had the correct slide to address this, this question. Uh, yeah. Basically, he asked to explain where the stress tube ends on an XLPE cable termination, where they can touch or pass without causing PD and where they cannot. So basically, Robert, um, to give you a short rundown on this, on the screen you'll see, uh, yeah, James, you can, you can open that next uh, picture. That one. Uh, yes, on the screen you can see where your, where your screen cut is ending. So basically, you've got your, your copper screen tape, which is your earth. And then just underneath that, you've got your semicon cut. So effectively, according to 
theory, you are able to, to cross cause within that earth area uh, without it having a big problem area. Be, be, below this area here. Yes. So anything above that area, will, if, if it touches, it will cause uh, some issues. Um, rule of thumb, or according to the IEC, you can have it, you need to have at least for 11 KV applications, a uh, 55 millimeter gap between the cores um, above that specific screen cut or semicon cut to, to uh, install cable safely. Thanks, James. Thanks, Naldo. Yeah, so uh, I'm just be running tight on time. So uh, I'm just going to run through these slides. Um, so this is uh, effectively a case study where you've got uh, single core XLPE cables. Um, not really a workman, well, the, the fact is, is that in this case, um, single core XLPE cables uh, only need to be earthed on one side. Um, we detected and found this with the online technology and then opened up. And you can actually see the overheating and the damage done to the terminations. Um, and this was detect detected with RF and ultrasound. And they had to redo these terminations, but effectively they just also had to remove the earths on both ends of the, on one end of the, of, of the circuit. Um, this one, again, 33 kV XLP cable terminations, and you can actually see the treeing, um, electrical treeing and the discharge occurred on these. Again, um, found with uh, online um, PD assessments. And then, I, as I've mentioned already, you know, if you do online PD um, and you do find a defect in a cable, the question is, is, well, what can you do about it and where is it? And uh, one of the other technologies that we do, and this is where we have to take a system offline, is to do offline VLF, TAN, Delta, and PD mapping, where we can actually then determine where the problem is in the cable. Is it in a joint? How far down the cable is it? Um, and again, um, quite expensive test equipment, but this allows us to then identify where it is and you know what needs to be replaced. Uh, so these, you know, those are just some case studies that we have. I'm going to hand over to Naldo now because we, we're quite tight on time. So Naldo, over to you. Okay, thanks, James. So currently we are running uh, one of the newer technologies that we are implementing within our substations or within client substations is IoT monitoring. Um, we all know about the, the industry 4.0 hype and where we're going to become everything to become nice and smart. So we decided we need to implement uh, a different type of technology to, to be able to implement or to run industry 4.0 uh, alongside with all our clients. So on the screen now, you'll see just a, a, a roadmap, which we use to implement um, the monitoring systems from where we get the arrangement with the client up to the end where we start to, to analyze the data and set up automatic trends and alarms. James, you can move on for me, please. Okay, so just a, a quick setup of what we will do within an MV substation. <laughs> Um, within your switch gear on your cable or on specific ends in, within the system, we will include specific sensors. It may be coupler sensors, uh, HFCTs, uh, TEV sensors, or, or se any type of sensors that we would like to include within the switch gear system. Obviously, do it safely and have the correct clearances. But from there, we add a monitoring device with some communications where we send that data to a commander dashboard where we can then view the live real-time data, um, push alarms through and also look at the trend. So you can move on for me to the next slide, please, James. Okay, so on this slide, you'll see an almost real um, set setup of a system where we will have discharges either within a cable or within a switch gear system or within a motor where we can send that specific signals via the sensors to our monitoring device, um, add it with communication. We can then specify where these discharges are coming from, uh, what type of discharges it is. Is it from the motor? Is it from the cable? Is it from a specific switchgear panel? We can then also, based on that knowledge, send an investigation team um, or send this information through to the client first and after that follow up with an investigation team to investigate the high level defects that we're finding or seeing on the system. Thanks James, you can move on please. Okay, so just when it comes to installing the sensors on the screen, you'll see two different applications. Uh, on the left hand side, that is a coupling uh, sensor, which we 
install on the cable itself. And on the right hand side, you'll see the similar sensors, but also an HFCT um, installation on the panels or inside the panels um, in a safe area where we don't compromise any clearances. We also do the similar with uh, temperature and humidity, as we know that that's also a drive that uh, both those factors do also have a big issue or impact on parcel discharge. Okay, James, you can move on for me, please. So looking at a case study where we've implemented the specific system on a client site, um, we saw quite high discharges coming from the IoT system. We sent a team to the client site where we did an advanced assessment on the specific switch gear. We then could identify and um, also see with the advanced equipment that there was high discharges, high tracking type discharges that was situated within the switchgear system of the client. Um, from where we then decided we need to intervene and do a visual inspection. So James, if you move on, please for me. Upon the visual inspection, we confirmed the, the high risk discharges that we saw. As you can see, there's quite nice uh, electrical trees that grew on the outside of these terminations. Uh, this was due to poor workmanship and due to the incorrect, uh, incorrect uh, materials that was installed within the switchgear system. And yeah, so our, our system detected this and we then helped the client. So on the screen now, you will see that there was two interventions, one during December and one during January, where the client had specific shuts where we had high discharges from November up until about the 18th of December or 14th of December, when we implemented the first shot and we could rectify some of these high risk terminations. In the yellow section, you can see that's the second area that we run um, up until the 18th of January, where they had a second opportunity to shut down for us, where we rectified a bit more of the, the, the defective terminations. And as you can see, there was a big, big decrease almost a 85% uh, risk reduction within their system. So this being a, a quite high risk or high value asset to the client, um, we, we could actually help them to reduce their risk. Um, just a question that I saw now coming from Robert um, on the installation of these coupler sensors on the cables. Yes, uh, Robert, it's quite easy to install on current installations. This specific uh, two photos were installed on existing installations. Um, you can also obviously include this within a new installation, which makes it easier. Um, but within a, an existing installation, these couplers can, coupler sensors can quite easily be installed, uh, if that answers your question. But uh, yeah, so that is one of the, one of the biggest uh, uh, case studies that, that I could share from my side, on the IoT side, where we actually saved our client from uh, definite failure. Although I think there's two other questions we can also in line. Um, I think Robert's earlier question was, if uh, sensors have set points, and then there's a question from uh, Tommy, can sensors be integrated with any BMS? Now, I wouldn't say any BMS. In principle, it should be, but, you know, devil is in the detail. Uh, but the data is definitely a system agnostic, so you can use it on, on any system if it's integratable. Um, the point being that you use your, your business management system uh, or an IoT system and set the alarms there and basically uh, trigger action based on those alarms. So to come back to, to Robert's question as well. So you can definitely set set points and alarms based on the values that, that we read. There's also a question about... Um, Calibration of sensors. I think that was uh, the IntelliSource sensors, James. Uh, and in particular, also, there was a question about MIST, where you defined SAW on the sensors of online monitoring of temperatures and buzz bars. Maybe just if you can come back to that, James. Okay. So, um, again, um, from a, well, if you're talking about PD and, and calibration of PD sensors, um, we, we, in, we can inject a PD pulse um, into, the, into, the, into the network. And, and then calibrate the sensors from that point of view to make sure that they're operating. But the fact is, is you know, from a PD point of view, there's no absolute value um, to say that you know, 100 millivolts or 1,000 millivolts of PD is bad or good. Uh, that's really trending. 
Um, so, but we do calibrate and we can calibrate. So we have a PD calibrator, which we use for calibration of, of the system, but also of the sensors to make sure that they're operational. On the surface acoustic side, we actually do calibration um, when we install the systems. Um, and effectively we look at the, the, you know, the temperature because effectively, you know, we can, in order for you to install it, the, the surface acoustic wave sensors, um, you need the, the, the network de-energized. Um, so we actually calibrate them at certain set points when we install them. Um, and then, um, you know, if we can, we will do some verification with infrared as well. Um, but typically once they're in, um, you know, they, they, they typically don't drift because, you know, it's a frequency component. Um, so there's not a, a, a large drift component that you use when you're looking at the surface acoustic wave. Yeah, but if need be, we... How, how often? Sorry? How often to calibrate? Again, you know, typ typically, unless there's an issue uh, that you're seeing, um, you know, you do some calibration checks when you do your main shuts. Uh, you wouldn't do them more than that. There's no reason to do it because otherwise it just introduces additional interventions that you don't need. Thank you. So, so typically, so let's, yeah. let's say roughly six months to 12 months. Ideally. Well, no, no. So typically there's no reason to calibrate every six months, um, you know, not not typically. It's only if you if you're replacing sensors um, that you would want to look to calibrate. Um, the sensors themselves are passive. Um, it's the it's the monitoring, the actual analyzers themselves that actually do the work. Perfect. Thank you, James. Okay. Pleasure. Then Ruan also posted a question: How does harmonics and uh, unbalance affect the PD measurements? From your experience, this is the first question, and two: And how do you eliminate possible false alarms through trending? Question. So, so typically, from a PD point of view, harmonics um, are effectively for us on noise. So we have different methodologies and different ways of eliminating noise. Um, if you look at PD, um, it, it will be picking up system noise. So we typically move higher up into the frequency range. So, so normally, noise and harmonics, you're going to see at the lower frequencies. Um, we go up into the, you know, the, in the megahertz range. So, and, you know, we can sweep at different frequencies, depending upon the PD technology we're using. We can, we can look at different frequency bands um, and effectively eliminate harmonics um, out of the system. So we're only looking at PD and not at, at system noise or, or harmonics. Um, so I don't know if that answers that question. Ron, happy with that? Good. That seems to be the questions. And we've seemed to run out of time, a little bit yep. over time, a little bit over time. So my apology for that. Uh, James's uh, email address is there on the screen. By all means, please contact us. And uh, we're more than happy to give you a lot more detail and uh, answer any specific questions that you, that you have. And even if you think that, or if you feel we didn't answer your question perfectly uh, during the session, please make contact with us. We're more than happy to go into a lot more detail with that. Thank you very much and have a fantastic day. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Thank you, everyone.